Hello. Hey, Steve, what's good, man? We on the show. Hey, how you doing, Coach, and your audience? Good Friday to everybody. All right, let's give hey, let's give Steve Kim a round of applause. Give him a give him a warm welcome. <laughs> hey, Steve, I learned something today. What was that? I learned that you was a hater. Oh, you just learned that. Oh, geez. <laughs> I the heard, last one to the party there. I heard it from Henry Garcia himself. <laughs> oh, Henry, my old buddy. <laughs> yeah, Henry. Boy, father of the year there. Jeez. <laughs> hey, I just got to listen to an interview from Henry. Henry said, Steve Kim, he, he said, you a hater. Victor Conti, he said, uh, Timothy Bradley, uh, Paula Malinagi, uh, 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 what's the other guy named? Chris Algieri. Uh, yes. Stephen A. Smith, he had a whole list. He he, had, he, he dissed all y'all. Yeah, I, I feel as though I'm in illustrious company, but uh, they, they seem to be in full full deflection and um, deceit mode. I think it's really interesting uh, what they are saying. And I I think it's really interesting. I sent you a video. Nonito and Rachel Donaire have put out some really interesting videos about how Vada works. They've been through the process. And how it really works. Look, they're going to have their day in court. And, you know, they're going to have to really defend themselves here. But the proof, um, the proof is going to be on them. They have to be able to prove this, that this is some nefarious plot to hurt one of the biggest name brands and cash cows in all of boxing. This whole notion that somehow boxing is protecting Devin Haney does not make sense to me given the fact that Ryan Garcia brings a lot more money to the table than he does. Yeah, that is true. I mean, I, I think I think the payout of that fight uh, was proof of that. I mean, I found out that Ryan Garcia was getting 55%, you know, um, of the per of, of, of whatever they agreed to, and Devin Haney was getting 40 45%. But even though Devin Haney has more accolades as a pro than Ryan Garcia. So I, I think you're right about that. He I mean, he was the draw um, in that. Um, so, right. Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, and there's, there's, there's some other things that the, uh, that are being said. Like, why did the test results come out when they did? Well, again, this is not this is not a pregnancy test. You just don't, you know, throw a little piss on it, and it comes either with a plus sign or a minus sign, and then you and you know you're you're pregnant or not. These things actually take time. There's a protocol towards it, and it's it's in line with other tests in terms of the time frame of when the results were released and so they did not allow somebody to go into the ring knowing that somebody failed a drug test that's another lie that they're talking about and you know henry garcia is not factually correct when he says that victor conte owns vada that that simply is not true he has consulted with them they asked him for some help he put people together that originally started it and that needed help in terms of how do you set up a drug testing protocol. And so, you know, we're going to have Victor Conte on Monday on the three knockdown rule. He'll get into more of it. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of things are being said here. And uh, uh, quite frankly, I think a lot of it is willful ignorance. Um, Steve, it's, it's amazing you said that because I looked at an article that, Vic, that Victor Conte sent me from USA Today. And when I read the headlines, it said something of the sort, uh, Ryan Garcia won. Oh, no, Ryan Garcia. It, it, they, I, I, need, I need to put it up. But it, it said something about uh, Ryan Garcia won um, a foul dirty or something like that. Um, but, and then it says, the very next line in the title, it said, but uh, the Haney's, you know, uh, uh, have very close relationship to Victor Conte's <laughs> Uh, 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 Vada or whatever, right? I, I'm, 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 yeah, that's I'm, from USA Today. USA I saw today. that. USA today. But again, yeah. I, I, you know, I said this on the Whitlock show today. The basic, the diversion tactic that they are using right now is almost like like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I know a guy that knew a guy that cut the hair, that trained and worked out and took snack products and knows Victor Conte. Yeah. You know, all of that may be true. Look, you know Victor. He's very transparent about his past with Balco. Yeah. He's also been very clear about his association with Devin Haney. But with that being said, I would say, what's that got to do with the price of tea in China? The drug test is a drug test, and now the result is the result. And, you know, look, I have never actually seen 
uh, or heard of an athlete who had a positive test, raise their hand and say, yeah, I did it. You busted me. Right. They, they really don't. They all deny it. They all deny it. Yeah. Can you hear me see? So, and the other thing is, uh, keep this in mind about the sample B or the B sample, right? Um, that comes from the same batch of piss as sample A. People make it sound like it's a different set of urine or blood. It's not. It's the same one. It's just split in half. So, so keep that in mind. So, um, I, I, you know, Steve, I'm gonna tell you something that's very, very intriguing. The comments. When, when I, when, when I, when, when I look around the internet and I do just research on certain things, I, I look, I look at the interviews, whoever gave the interviews, or whatever, right? The Twitter post or whatever. But I immediately am drawn to the comments because the comments tell you what people are thinking. And I'm telling you. Steve, there's a lot of people out there that honestly believe that there's a conspiracy against Ryan Garcia because of his position that he's taken against the elites, the Illuminati. He's taking pictures with President Trump. And, you know, anybody associated with Trump, uh, they, they, you know, they, they mysteriously charges get brought up on them. They go to jail, this and that, this and that, because, you know, he's the, he the, he the most evil white, uh, white man in the world, Trump, according to the people who say this. So um, this, this is this is this is what they are saying, and it's not to to them. It's not far fetched that hey, every, the system is against him. We've seen things like this before. Yada yada yada. What what's what say you about that? Because they don't they don't believe that that Ryan is getting in a fair shake here. They don't believe well, that he has something in his system. They think that he was it was really just a conspiracy against him. Yeah, Coach, let, let me get into that because I don't think there's any doubt that there's a groupie culture yeah. in our culture, in our society today that looks up to Ryan. I mean, I, I said this before and I'll say it again. Ryan's genius is making a generation of dumb people think that he's very smart and insightful. That in itself is genius. So he's almost has like this cult-like figure or status. The other thing is I think there's a lot of fans out there that are very biased culturally. Uh, a lot of these super pochos, as I like to call them, who now all of a sudden are claiming La Raza, who deserted him last year after the Tank Davis fight. So now it becomes a cultural thing. Yeah. A lot of fans who are Mexican, Mexican-American, are writing off this. They don't want to hear anything that's factual. But at the same time, but I also think that there are a lot of Tank Davis fans who revel in the downfall of Devin Haney, and you know why, because of Bill Haney and his associations with certain uh, YouTube channels. So this thing has all become this thing about what is your agenda, yeah. you know? And that, that's, that, that's why I think it's really interesting that yeah. the same people that'll tell you that Ryan was handicapped against Tank Davis because of the catch weight and the rehydration clause will now tell you that it was only three pounds that Ryan missed weight by. What's the big deal? Uh, see, my view is this. I'm consistent. I didn't like what was done in either fight. So, you know, and I'm going to say something here that, that's probably going to upset people. And I said it to Jason Whitlock earlier. I have never seen a fighter not make weight on purpose, which he admitted, and then fail a drug test. I've seen one or the other. I've never seen the both at the same time um the word i would use and the word that comes to mind is premeditated now with that said now i'm going to get real deep on people bill haney got really arrogant and showed a lot of hubris because he thought they could win this fight regardless and that is on them this became all about the money. Because I asked somebody that works with them, why wasn't there a morning of weigh-in or a rehydration cap? And I was told by this individual, we were gonna, we asked for it, or he told Golden Boy, then all of a sudden when it came about the money, it's like, don't worry about it, just show up tomorrow. So there's a price to pay for everything. And with that said, even with what went on, Devin has to become a better well-schooled technician. His chin's up in the air, pulling back out straight, uh, the right hand was not glued to his chin. So it's never just one thing, Coach. It's everything. It's amazing you said that. So, um, because a lot of people was like, why they didn't 
do this. Okay, let's see if Ryan Garcia can get those three pounds off, or whatever. And let's let's re, let's uh, do another way in the next day, the day of the fight. But from what I'm hearing, the reason why the Haney's did not want to do that because Devin Haney was rehydrating. Yeah, and look, that 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 is also a factor. Like that, that weigh in from the time it took place, the real weigh in to the time they stepped in the ring, I believe was about thirty seven hours. But look, that money that Ryan paid o paid over the regular purse, the penalty clause, which I guess was not a half a half a million per pound. I think it was more two hundred thousand. Look, that was the insurance clause. That number one, I get to come in at my best, and I get to see. Here's the thing: where well, Ryan is really smart. He understood that the general casual fan will only care about the victory. They will not care about the nuances or the details. Because mm -hmm. most fans don't realize three pounds when your body fat is under six, seven, eight percent is a lot. It's actually the toughest cut you can make. It's not like a guy that's 330 pounds at five foot seven losing three pounds hanging out in a sauna for 10 minutes. It's a little bit different. Um, but they should have known better. They fell for the trap. I think they got really arrogant. They misjudged what, what exactly was going to happen. And also, through Ryan Garcia's credit, you still have to land the punches. Mm -hmm. You still have to land the punches. So again, there's a lot of factors here. But anyone that says three pounds is not much, obviously does not know much about weight cuts and what actually an athlete goes through at the world-class level. I can lose three pounds. My body fat's not at a point where three pounds is going to affect me all that much. That's This is what Timothy Bradley was saying. And Timothy Bradley was saying, look, man, um, uh, a lot of people look calling him a hater, this and that, yada, yada, yada. But this is what Timothy Bradley was saying. So what you're saying is, in, in spite of all of that, the Haney's wanted to take the fight anyways because of the money. Like, they could have, because people was asking, okay, once this guy came in three pounds of a weight, why, you, why, why they didn't cancel the fight? And... Of course, I mean, they can't cancel the fight. I mean, There's no precedent for it. Yeah. Coach, can I tell you something? I what? talked about this on the three knockdown rule a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I was at the last fight that was last big fight that was really canceled because someone didn't make weight. It was the third fight between Jose Luis Castillo and Diego Corrales. Right. And I remember me and Doug Fisher drove up there. By the time we drove up there, they said, see, there is no fight. So I'll never forget. We go to the weigh-in. There's a few hundred people. They sold a lot of tickets. It was at the Thomas and Mac uh, in Las Vegas. And both Gary Shaw, God rest his soul, he just recently passed away, and Bob Arum had to get up in front of all these people and say, hey, look, this is what happened. We didn't make weight, blah, blah. And, I mean, people started booing. They were pissed off. But they said, but we're still going to go on with the rest of the show tomorrow, and everyone can come. Coach, there may have been 50 people that night. No one showed up. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I always look back at that event and say, that's the night or that is the weekend where people said, we got to get these guys into the fight. See, what I don't like about the situation um, going on with the weight is that if one guy doesn't make weight, the pressure seems to be on the guy that followed the rules and sacrificed to do the right thing for the event and put himself at a disadvantage. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, and I, I, there's something very wrong. Here's my view. If I am the commission, I would say, you know, in a fight or a situation where one fighter makes weight and the other one doesn't, if that fight goes on that next morning, you must do a second day weigh in with the weight limit cap. Don't leave it in the hands of the promoters. Don't leave it in the hands of anyone else, but you as the sanctioning body or the, you know, the commission have to say, look, we're not going to even put this up for a debate. We understand the show must go on, but 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, you cannot weigh more than this, and then we'll do the fight. That's it. That's how you solve the problem. Yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember when we was in L.A., and uh, me, you, and Buddy McGirt was talking, and uh, you was talking about what would alleviate uh, fighters, you know, weight and all that stuff there. And you know, you know, we were talking about weight cuts and you know, fighting on the playing, uh, even even playing field. Cause you got some guys are just so called what they like to call weight bullies and stuff like that. And Buddy McGirt said, and the same thing that you said. He said, "What would alleviate that? That, that is uh, no. have, have same have same day weigh ins." Right. I, I mean, coach, I'm looking at some of this uh, footage of these MMA fighters today, seemingly dying in these little hot boxes to lose weight, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" 
Uh, I mean, is, is Devin Haney a weight bully with what he does? I think there's an argument you could say he is. Here's the problem. He's playing within the rules. If you want to have these weigh-ins over 36 hours before they step into the ring and there's no rehydration cap unless it's an IBF fight, this is what people are going to stretch the system, but he is not breaking any rules. Here's a, I'll give you another example, Coach. When Gennady Golovkin fought Danny Jacobs, they had a real early weigh-in because the commission had a scheduling issue. Yeah. Because the fight was for multiple belts, Danny Jacobs just blew off the IBF weight limit on the second day, that Saturday, while Golovkin didn't, and then Jacobs put on a bunch of pounds because he had a head start. You know what? I didn't, he didn't break any rules per se outside the IBF. He made himself ineligible for that title. But I emailed Daryl Peoples, the IBF president. I have a very good relationship with him. And I said, Jeff, here's the problem with your rule. It's a great rule, but in a unification bout, Danny Jacobs may not even care about your belt. He just wants to win, and he still gets to play for that other belt. So what they did was the IDF after that fight said, in a unification bout, Coach, we're not doing that rehydration. We're not doing that second-day weigh-in. Yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying, because the IBF, you can't, you can't fight no more than 10 pounds above the limit, right? Right, and I think there is a percentage ratio that changes as you go up in weight. But look, I, I am old school. It'll never happen. But my, my view is this. Have everyone weigh in the morning of a fight, and you'll have a bunch of fighters fighting at their proper weight class. Hey, Steve, you know what? You hit the nail right on the head because a lot of these guys are weight bullies. I don't feel sorry for a fighter. Like, I didn't feel sorry for Virgil Ortiz. These guys are like 5'11", 5'10", 5'11", damn near six feet tall. Um, just Ron Boots in this and stuff like that. Guy, if, if guys are struggling to make weight, it's because you're too big for the weight. You're not supposed. You shouldn't be fighting at that small ass weight class, anyways. Move your ass up and fight in the weight class that you're supposed to fight in, so you don't be struggling to kill yourself. Like I be hearing people say, "Oh man, he's killing himself to make weight. Man, he's struggling to make weight." Okay, well shit, he that that his body is telling him, "Look, dog, we can't be fighting in the small ass weight class." Because the reason why these bigger fighters want to fight in smaller weight classes is because you and I know they want to have an advantage over the smaller fighter. Yeah, and here's the other thing, Coach. What they're doing now is they're weaponizing the weigh-in. Some weigh-ins are at 8 o'clock in the morning. Some weigh-ins are at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And when, when Ryan Garcia faced Tank Davis, the real weigh-in actually took place at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was not a morning weigh-in because they wanted to have Ryan Garcia struggle and strain for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the difference between having an 8 or 9 a.m. weigh-in as opposed to 3 p.m.? Well, it's not only just six, seven hours. It's actually two full meals. It makes a difference. If you ever talk to these strength and conditioning coaches that have to, to replenish these fighters, there's a real protocol that you go through in terms of getting your body um, back in line. That you just can't eat a bunch of food all at once. It has to be gradual. You have to put in the right amount of carbs. And so all of this now, to me... What was once supposed to be, and this was implemented by Flip Homansky at Nevada. They're the ones who started this bullshit, okay? Hmm. It was supposed to be about rehydrating fighters for their own safety. Okay, that is in theory. But, Coach, here's the problem. Weigh-ins now are basically weaponized. And if the A side wants to have an early weigh-in because they're the ones struggling and they need more rehydration time and be the quote-unquote weight bully... They'll have it at 8 o'clock in the morning. But if it's the other way around and they know the other guy is starving to make weight and he's struggling, they do it at 3 o'clock. I've seen it. <laughs> there should be a universal <laughs> weigh-in yeah. time for every commission yeah. for yeah. championship fights, yeah. in my view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see exactly what you said. I, I, got, I got a question. I got a good question for you right here. Um, strength and conditioning coaches. There's somebody that me and you both know, but you know this, you know this brother a lot more, uh, better than I do. He has a problem with strength and conditioning coaches. What say you about strength and conditioning coaches? And now we have PEDs a lot just supposed to be running rapping in boxing. What, what, what say you about that? You know, you know the guy you're talking about is the esteemed Rudy Hernandez, the mm -hmm. brother of the late great Chicanito Hernandez, great friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, we have dinner often, and, I, and he's one of the most, um, I would say, honest, blunt, intelligent, knowledgeable human beings ever. And he's also the UFC cut man. And he's always said, Steve, my strength and conditioning uh, program is very simple. 
and he's told me this for years. We shadow box a lot, we hit the heavy bag, and we spar a lot, and then you run a little bit, and you fight more often. That's it. He does not believe in, in strength and conditioning, like lifting weights, any resistance exercises, and he just thinks that's the way you do it. And he says, Steve, none of my fighters has ever gotten tired in a fight unless they got hit a lot. And he says, Steve, these strength and conditioning coaches are great at making these guys go into unnatural weight and then overtraining them, but making them look really sexy at the weigh-in. Mm. And that's the truth. So I, I do think the strength and conditioning coaches, and I'm not against them completely, though. I, I veer off a little bit in a sense that as long as that strength and conditioning coach is working in condition, in coordination with the boxing coach to do functional exercises and to make sure you're not overtraining your client, it can work. There are some really good ones that I like. Okay, but I do. I think a lot of them get their egos involved and, and they start bulking up these guys yeah. in ways that are not functional. Yes, that's where I really I, I do think Rudy has a point. Um, Steve, I've heard from several people in, in the sport. Uh, I won't mention any names, but I heard from several people in the sport, man, that um, a lot of a lot of your top world class athletes in boxing and just even in different sports. But in Boston in particular, they say they say most of these fighters are on, 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 on some type of um, PED. I don't have any proof of that, but... Um, Coach, let me just tell you something. To not be suspicious of every world-class athlete makes you naive. So, so I don't want to just paint this broad brush over Ryan Garcia, because that would not be fair. I don't think it would be accurate. There is an old quote from Ben Johnson's track coach. Ben Johnson, the infamous sprinter from Canada, set the world record in 1988, and then that gold medal was stripped because it turned out he failed his drug test. Beat Carl Lewis. He had the whole pharmacy inside his body as he blew away Carl Lewis. Yeah. And he said, it's a level playing field, just not the one you think it's on. Because, Coach, if, I don't know if you ever watched the 30 for 30 on that particular situation in Ben Johnson, do you know out of the eight or nine runners in the 1988 hundred meter finals in Seoul, Korea, did you know seven or eight of them had either been suspended or had dabbled in drugs or there was a high suspicion? So it's not like, it's not like Ben Johnson was the only one. He was just the best one. They were all kind of doing the same thing. And I've always said about Barry Bonds, Barry Bonds was not the only guy doing it. Barry Bonds was actually hitting home runs off pitchers that, guess what, were also on PEDs. It's a level playing field, just not the one you think it's on. Wow. It, 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 it's, it's so much. It's so much. Um, um, you, know, you know what I see going on, Steve? I, I, call this, I call this the celebrity worship culture. I remember There's no I, doubt. I remember when I spoke to you, you said something that made so much sense to me, and I quote this on the show all the time. I, and um, I'm enjoying doing these shows, boxing now, because I've taken the emotion out of it. And I, I, something that you said to me, you say, listen, coach, I've come to the conclusion that I've seen the best years of boxing that I'm going to see. And, yeah. Uh, now, we're getting some good fights now, uh, thanks to Turk Alashik and stuff like that. Shout out to him. We're getting some good fights now and stuff like that. So um, um, you, so you said that you're not really emotionally, you know, you're not into it anymore. It, it is, oh, it look, is. I'm doing it. I follow it. I cover it. Am I going to as many fights as I once did? Eh, you know, I actually kind of enjoy just being able to sleep in my own bed, hang out with some friends, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and not have to either drive several hours back home in the early morning or having to catch a flight. Um, and I can still do the same job. I'm always going to be honest and truthful. I'll always enjoy boxing. But yeah. this, this is what I, I'm just telling you is that, look, there are still a Terrence Crawford. There's still an in a way. Yeah. There are still guys that I say, man, you could have fought in any era. But, Coach, and maybe I am the old man shouting at the clouds, telling the kids to get the fuck off my lawn. I'm proud of it. I embrace my age because what you call age, I call wisdom. And what you call youth, I call ignorance. It's fine. We don't always have to see eye to eye. But as someone that grew up in the 80s who got to see Marvin Hagler, Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Tommy Hearns, Larry Holmes, Mike Tyson, and then got to transition to men like James Tony, Mike McCallum, yeah. and then Marco Antonio Barrera, Morales, Pacquiao, Mayweather, Roy Jones, uh, Winky Wright, guys of that stature 
And Oscar De La Hoya, got to give him a lot of credit. Absolutely. And then a Golovkin, and now a Canelo, who's kind of going, going towards the sunset. I don't think I want to see guys like that. I, and the fighters don't fight as much. They're not as seasoned. I don't think the fights are as good. I, I really don't. And again, am I, am I a prisoner lost in my generation? Maybe I am. But think about this, Coach. What group of fights right now could HBO or any other network do a Legendary Night series on, and you'd be like, yes, absolutely. I still watch those HBO Legendary Nights. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? You know what? Uh, that, that's a that, that's a good that's a good qu that's a good point you made. Uh, and the reason why I said that, Steve, was because of this. Now I have I don't I don't really have any emotion in it like that. So it makes these shows a lot more easier to do. Um, I love hearing from the callers because the callers are going to tell you how they feel. Um, and it's all based on emotions and feelings and stuff like that. Um, it seems that a lot of these fighters. They caught up in the social media hoopla as well. It seems that there's some kind of information war that's, uh, that's out there. Um, you got everybody have their group of fans, Steve, that are ride or die for them. Ryan Garcia fans, they love him to death. Tank Davis fans, they love him to death. Devin Haney fans, they love him to death. And um, Shakur fans or whatever. And then there's just boxing. And it, it seems every group, these guys, I don't look at them as like boxing fans. I think they're more fans of their fighter and the fighter can't do any wrong. Um, you know, belts don't mean anything anymore. They, see, they lost me when they said belts don't mean nothing and legacy don't matter. And, and the new way, oh, he ain't doing nothing. And what he doing, ain't doing, he ain't doing nothing. What Terrence Crawford doing, they're not doing anything. And I'm like, dude, you know, what Alexander Usa doing, he ain't doing that. Don't nobody know him. He's a Euro bomb. When, when these boxing fans today start telling me legacy don't matter, they start repeating, they started using Floyd Mayweather talking points. Oh, man, I can't feed my kids with belts. Belts don't do nothing, uh, collect dust, this and that. When they start doing that, I say, you know what, I'm going to still do boxing, but emotionally, I'm done. Well, I, I have fun with it. I think the sport can be very, very entertaining, but it's also very, very mockable. And I, I, I don't like when Henry Garcia called me a piece of shit. I thought it was kind of amusing. I said, thanks. Cause it helped out our traffic. I got more followers out of it. I should send them a Hallmark thank you card. I don't really take it all that personal. And when people say you're a hater, I just say, no, I have an opinion that you care about. And one day I'll probably never care about your opinion. But yes, if you want to call me a hater, I like to think that I'm a truth teller. See, I, I think that's one of the funniest things when people say, you're biased. I say, no, 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 no. I have an opinion that you don't like. Because yeah. if you agreed with me, you'd never call me biased. Yeah. You've got to be able to handle it. And, and that is really the key to having fun in this thing is get this, coach. Be knowledgeable, but do not take it too seriously. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Don't take it too seriously. And, um, you know, you, you hit the nail right on the head. I, I don't... Um, you have to. You have to be very knowledgeable. You can't take it too seriously. And people are going to feel the way they feel. I realize that at the end of the day, these are feelings. And who am I to get caught up in another man's feelings? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Right. And by the way, <laughs> let them because it's going to be more lucrative for you. Because yeah, yeah. um, one day, uh, I would just tell all these people that may not like you or me, the bottom line is you're on the show listening to both of us. Who's the real winner? Who's the real loser? Yeah. And that's fine. I've always as I grow older, I really don't care if you disagree with me or not. I believe in the First Amendment. I do not think we always have to see eye to eye, especially as I branch out into doing other things like Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I realize people allow you to have an opinion or they will respect it as long as they agree. Right. And I'm like, huh. That's true. That's interesting. Because in the past, I don't think I handled that well. And that's why, Coach, what's funny is I don't actually block people that much on Twitter anymore. I just mute them because now, now here's the thing. Now you get to listen to me, and I never get to hear you. That's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. So, so what, what, what's next for Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia from this point forward? I, I know we can't predict the future, but okay, what's the process that Ryan is going to have to go through? Is he going to appeal uh, the decision or what? of the commission and we're gonna have to see what that b sample says and look he does not care about the belts he doesn't and i've said this he's above the belts his popularity and his fan base do not care about the belts yeah. good for him that can be very very lucrative i don't think that he'll i don't believe that his core fan base 
even cares about this stuff. They saw the visuals, the fight happened. To them, it's a win. It does not matter if he's stripped or if it's a no contest. Now, what's going to happen is, the bigger issue is, will the New York State Athletic Commission, number one, um, take action in terms of the result of the fight? Okay. Number two, though, is how long, if they suspend him, and again, I'm just making an assumption, if they suspend him, Six to 12 months, it's not that big of a deal, Coach, because we've talked about this. That these, In an era where guys fight once or twice a year, yeah. suspending a fighter for one year is like suspending a starting pitcher in Major League Baseball five days. What is really lost? Not all that much. The other thing is, I do believe that if you are a future opponent of Ryan Garcia and you have good representation, I would make sure that the penalty clauses for the contracted weight are almost like two, three, four, five million dollars a pound. Because I don't know what else is going to keep another guy from saying, oh, God, Ryan, three pounds overweight. Hey, write me a check and we're good. I, I believe in fair fights. I believe that the skill and the execution on that night should win a fight, not this other stuff. I don't like handicap matches. Don't believe in them. Um, but look, do people want to face Ryan Garcia? Yes. Does he, he will bring you the biggest payday you have for the most part. So I think there's a couple of things you got to do. You got to put in stiff penalties for weight. You better get paid well. And you also better have stringent drug testing. Okay. So, um, again, uh, uh, well, you know, in order for you to do that, you have to be in a position to negotiate that Ryan Garcia <clears throat> like you say, he's the, he's the, he's the payday guy. He's like the cash cow or whatever. You're gonna make your most money fighting him. So I'm pretty sure he's gonna be the one be, be the one more more so to be able to di dictate the terms more so than someone who's maybe considered a B side to him. As it relates to Devin Haney, where does he go from here? Oh, that's a great question because regardless of how it was done or what may or may have not been in the system of Ryan Garcia and how it may or may not have aided Ryan Garcia, the damage he took stays with him. Yeah. Okay, because every time you go into a ring, you come out of it a little bit different. There's a thing called erosion. That particular fight, I think, eroded Devin Haney quite a bit. He may never be the same. And again, I'm making an assumption. We'll see. Devin Haney will be looked upon as a very vulnerable guy. He will not have issues getting fights. I think people are now going to be willing to try to walk right through all his boxing and his quick hands because they realize at 140, he can't break a smoke ring. So that's going to be interesting. And I, I think, forget the, the, the physical damage, Coach. I'm actually concerned about Devin Haney psychologically. Where is he right now in the wake of that fight? Um, it's amazing you said that because I had a caller call here, uh, um, Curtis from Long Beach. He said the same thing. He said, "No, nah, he think he think it's gonna be real easy for Devin Haney to get fights." So um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you this before I let you go. I'm of the opinion I thought he fought the wrong game game plan against Ryan Garcia. Um, and I understand because the Haney's wanted to prove wanted to prove they can knock him out. His father came on the show. And I think I kind of like hyped him up to, to, to put that game plan together. Because I was like, listen, man, the man disrespecting you. He's calling you a fake Muslim. Um, he's talking about your white wife at home. He's saying that um, uh, uh, you're a con man. You're a pimp. You this, you that. He's talking about your religion. He's saying that your son been diddy -fied, you know, at the pool party with Diddy. I'm like, man, you, you, you have to put down a spectacular performance, very similar to Roy Jones versus Vinny Paziana. You know, uh, James likes out Tony versus... Um, uh, uh, what's my guy's name? Uh, he got beat by uh, uh, damn James Lights. I told him to beat the brace off him too. I always forget his name. Oh, I uh, ran Barkley. I ran Barkley. I ran Barkley. The way Floyd beat Arturo Gotti, and Bill was like, "Yeah, man, yeah, we gonna take it to his front door, and we going I can guarantee you, he gonna be, he gonna be uh, put hit the canvas twice." And Devin Haney said, "I'm, I'm gonna knock him out and this and that." So I think that they, the game plan was wrong. That's, I, that's what I think more so. Um, what really hurt him in that particular fight. But from this from this point going forward, Steve, my point is this, what I want to ask you. I think you need to keep Devin Haney away from boxer punchers. Stay the hell away from Super Real Matias. As a boxer fan, I want to see that fight. But that guy has concussive punching power. 
someone like a Teofimo Lopez, that's that that's that may be another issue as well from an athleticism standpoint. If if Devin Haney is not right mentally, if he's if he's believing, man, I'm chinny, man, I'm chinny, because that's everybody, everybody say he's chinny, he's chinny, his punch resistance is not there. You know, how do you how do you move him from this point forward? Coach, I'm going to say something that the Haney's probably well, at least one of the Haney's is not going to like, and the other one may never admit it publicly. Mm. It is time for Devin to get a full-time professional coach. Bill Haney's done a really nice job of guiding his son's career, mm. managing it, monetizing it. But uh, is he really a world-class boxing trainer and corner man? I don't know. They've gone through different guys. They used to be with Floyd Mayweather. Uh, then they were with Roger Mayweather. They brought in Ben Davidson. But at the end of the day, it's always about saving a little bit of money and keeping the money in family. I get it. It happens a lot. They're not the only ones. Here's what we really found out about Devin Haney. He's a really good, technically sound boxer with good in and out movement, but he's not slick. Slick means being able to evade punches inside the pocket, inside the pocket. To, and also to catch and counter really? and also to be able to roll with punches. Yep. Um, and I think that there is a, most common mistake, and we all fall into it. I know I did. Anytime we see a athletic, and if it's a black fighter with a little bit of speed, we all say he's slick. Yes, no, no, he just yeah. might be athletic and well schooled. See, me and Breadman Edwards, Stephen Edwards, talk about that a lot. Right. That Steve, there's a difference. All of you guys get into this slick mode. Guys aren't slick. They just might be fast or quick, but that does not mean they're slick. So, and if you look at Devin. I don't understand how, coming into that fight, you look at that other guy across from you, what's the one thing you got to take away? Left hook. Left hook. You know the left hook is coming either as a lead left hook, a chuck left hook, yeah. or a cleanup left hook. Yeah, yeah. And for that right hand not to be plastered with the cell phone next to the ear, yeah, yeah. right, to parry the punches, to guard against it, and to move away from it, and in the first 30 seconds you lay right into the pocket, head on the right side, chin up, and then it gets popped, and your neck gets snapped back like a Pez dispenser. Mm. That's bad execution, and that is bad planning. So, um, did you keep him away from boxer punchers? I keep him away from anyone that is an above-average puncher right now. Mm. Eventually, you can't avoid everybody. Right. Now, keep this in mind, Coach. His mandatory is Sandor Martin, yeah. the Spaniard, very slick southpaw. Now, he's actually pretty slick, but he's not a great puncher. So that's a relatively safe fight. But we saw with Sandor, ask Teofimo Lopez how difficult that guy is. Yeah, he's very difficult. He Actually, he dropped Teofimo twice. They they didn't count the second. They, they counted the first knockdown, but they disregarded, the referee disregarded the second knockdown. I'm like, man, but when they showed it again, I'm like, no, that was a, that was a knockdown. Yeah, that was a knockdown. So. Yeah, and you could make an argument that he won that fight, but in terms of punching power, yeah. That's a good fight. Now, the style may not be ideal, um, but look, he, he is still the WBC junior welterweight champion, and I think that they have said, hey, Sandor Martin has to be next. So we shall see how Bill handles this. But again, I don't know if Devin can ever really leave his father and say, hey, I'm just going to pick up a real like full-time trainer here. I know the way these family dynamics work. They get very, very difficult in terms of these decisions. Yeah. All right, man. Well, Steve, man, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time out. I really appreciate you. Um, let everybody know how they can get in contact with you. If they want to hate on you, if they want to send you gun emojis, they want to tell you which <laughs> fights that you better not come to, they want to tell you to drop the addies, how can they How can they get in contact with you on social media in order to be able to do that? Well, I mean, at Twitter, it's at Steve Kim. Three two three. Uh, then also, you can go. Uh, obviously, after this fine program ends, go to YouTube. Punch in the three knockdown rule. That's Mario Lopez and I. And by the way, I just want to remind everybody we're going to have Victor Conte on for a segment next week to dispel some of the things um, that has been said about him, Snack, and Vada. And on Instagram, uh, this is where I show my East LA roots. Um, my handle is Steve Orale Kim. So it's Steve O. A R L E Kim, and you can get me there. And also, and for full disclosure, I write uh, twice weekly 
um, column for Snack.com called Canine's Corner. So anyone that says, well, this is why you like Victor Conte, and I say, yeah, I do. So what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but he should be being honest about it. All right, but Steve Kim, um, thank you, uh, thank you, brother, for co uh, coming on the show. I appreciate you. Anytime to your audience. You guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the fights this weekend, and Coach, we'll talk soon, man. Great job as always. Yes, sir. Man, I'm out of here, bro. Let's go. Come on.